Leslie Ray Charping passed away a few years ago at the age of 74. His daughter wrote his obituary. When it appeared on the Funeral Home website, it went viral and uh, received so many hits that it crashed the website. The, ob the obituary is so uh, scathing, so bitter, so caustic that you, you, you'll be tempted to believe it's some kind of joke, but it is not. This is the obituary that appeared. This is real. Leslie Ray Popeye Charping was born in Galveston on November 20, 1942, and passed away January 30, 2017, which was 29 years longer than expected and much longer than he deserved. Leslie battled with cancer in his later years and lost his battle ultimately to being the horse's A blank blank he was known for. He leaves behind two relieved children, a son, Leslie Roy Charping, and a daughter, Sheila Smith, along with six grandchildren and countless other victims, including ex-wife, relatives, friends, neighbors, doctors, nurses, and random strangers. At a young age, Leslie quickly became a model example of bad parenting, combined with mental illness and a complete commitment to drinking, drugs, womanizing, and being generally offensive. Leslie enlisted to serve in the Navy, but not so much in a brave and patriotic way, but as more of a plea deal to escape sentencing on criminal charges. Leslie was surprising and surprisingly intelligent, however, he lacked ambition and motivation to do anything other than being reckless, wasteful, squandering the family savings, and fantasizing about get-rich-quick schemes. Leslie's hobbies included being abusive to his family, expediting trips to heaven for the beloved family pets, and fishing, which he was less skilled at than the previously mentioned activities. Leslie's life served no other obvious purpose. He did not contribute to society or serve his community. He possessed no redeeming qualities besides quick-witted sarcasm, which was amusing during his sober days. With Leslie's passing, he will be missed only for what he never did, being a loving husband, father, and a good friend. No services will be held. There will be no prayers for eternal peace and no apologies to the family he tortured. Leslie's remains will be cremated and kept in a barn until Ray, the family donkey's wood shavings, run out. Leslie's passing proves that evil does in fact die and hopefully marks a time of healing and safety for all. That was his obituary written by his daughter. One news agency said it's hard to read and difficult to imagine the raw hatred this man engendered. Uh, a news agency reached out to her and she said, all she said was, I told the truth, I'm not sorry for telling the truth, and I'm not sorry for standing up for myself. And then she added these words, this obituary was intended to help bring closure. Although I appreciate everyone's concern, it would have been much more appreciated at any time during my childhood. We're in a series called Generational Blessing and Curse, and we've been looking at what the Bible calls the sin of the parents. And we've seen that sin is not done in isolation. Sin has a ripple effect. The Bible's very clear on this, that sin affects other people, and it affects generations of people. We've been looking at verses like this one from the book of Exodus. The sins of the parents are laid upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. As we talked about last week, our families of origin affect us for good or for ill. And when it's for ill, it leaves scars and wounds. We can walk the rest of our days with a limp, uh, crippled, uh, hard to function, broken. It, it can leave gaping holes in our hearts that we spend the rest of our lives trying to fill. When there is sin and dysfunction in a family, it affects those children and affects the children of those children. But the pattern can be broken. The sin of the parents does not have to be repeated. It doesn't have to be crippling. Today we're going to continue to study the story of this famous biblical family. Today we're going to look at the story of Joseph. Joseph's father was Jacob, and last week we noted how Jacob was misparented himself, 
and how he uh, uh, wrestled his whole life long to get, the fam- to get the blessing that eluded him in childhood. He made a lot of mistakes himself, and yet Jacob is remembered as one of the great patriarchs of the faith. The Bible frequently refers to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is one of the big three father figures of Israel. In fact, it is from him that Israel takes its name. Jacob was renamed Israel. Uh, Israel is literally the people of Jacob, the people of Israel, his other name. His 12 sons become heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, each tribe taking the name of that son. And so we have the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Dan, and so on. Last week we noted that Jacob had a very unusual marriage, even by ancient standards. He had two wives. Did Jacob want two wives? No. He wanted to marry his beloved Rachel. And remember uh, the story, he promised Rachel's dad that he would work for the dad for seven years if he was allowed to marry Rachel at the end of those seven years of labor. At the end of the seven years of labor, on the wedding night, the father-in-law pulls a switcheroo and Jacob marries the wrong daughter. He marries Leah and he works another seven years till he can have Rachel's hand in marriage. Because Jacob like everyone who missed the family blessing, has come to believe that he has to earn his love, that he has to prove his value before he can be loved. So now he's got two wives, but only one that he really loves. But it gets worse. Only one of the wives was able to have children. The other one, as much as she tried, was not. And the one who was able to have children was Leah. And the one who was not able to have children was the favorite wife, Rachel. Leah was able to have children. In fact, she was a machine. She bore son after son after son. Uh, In the end, she had eight sons. Six she bore herself. Two were born through her handmaiden, Zilpah. But according to the culture of that time, those were considered Leah's children as well. But not one child from Leah, the beloved wife. That is until much later, when Jacob was an old man, somehow, some way, after years of trying, she becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a baby and they call him Joseph. And then miracle of miracles, a few years later, she gets pregnant again and gives birth to Benjamin. But tragically, she dies in giving birth to Benjamin. So here's the family now. Twelve sons from Jacob's wives. Only two are from his beloved Rachel, who has now passed away. And we'll pick up the story there as we read Genesis 37. Now Israel, that's Jacob, same guy. Israel, Jacob, two names for the same guy. Jacob, Israel, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, stop there. Jacob loved Joseph more than the other children, and he showed it. Why is this surprising? It's surprising because Jacob's parents did the very same thing to him. His own family had been torn apart by favoritism, and now he's doing the very same thing to his kids. Why is it not surprising? It's not surprising because family patterns tend to repeat themselves. And so Jacob gives his favorite son a robe. It's a clear sign of favoritism. It'd be like saying, hey, all you boys, uh, for Christmas this year, you're all getting bicycles. Except for you, Joseph, you're getting a BMW. (laughs) Blatant favoritism. And all the other brothers come to hate him. And this led to verbal and emotional abuse. And to make matters worse, Joseph has this dream that they're out in the fields binding sheaves of grain. And in this dream, the sheaves of the brothers gather around the sheaves of Joseph and they all bow down. And Joseph made the mistake of telling his brothers about the dream. He should have kept this to himself, but he did not. He told them, hey guys, it's like all of you were bowing down to me. What do you think that means? And his brother says, it means you got to go. And they began to plot to take their brother out. 
Now, what is Jacob doing in all of this? The father, he knew he was playing favorites. He knew his sons hated Joseph. He knew about the dreams. Joseph told the father as well. What does he do? Nothing. Did he stop playing favorites? No. Did he intervene? No. Did he try to protect his son from the emotional and verbal abuse? No. Here's what the Bible says the father did. But his father kept the matter in mind. He did nothing. He kept it in his mind. This could be translated from the Hebrew. He wondered about it. I wonder why my sons don't like Joseph. I wonder why my sons don't get along. The brothers of Joseph decide to kill him. That's how far this gets. They start to make a plan how to do it. All the brothers working together on a common goal. And one brother had a change of heart. He had a moment of compassion. And it's almost with irony. This brother says this, come Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. Let, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. After all, he is our brother. Let's sell him into slavery. It's the decent thing to do. Yeah, I mean, talk about family problems. At least my kids have never tried to sell each other to my knowledge. Now, if you know much about the rest of the story of Joseph, you know his life did not get any easier. He was sold to an Egyptian official, and that worked okay for a while until he was falsely accused of rape by that Egyptian official's wife, which led to prison. And then he was betrayed in prison, even though he helped other prisoners get out of prison. It was as if everyone he trusted, everyone he tried to serve, everyone he tried to love hated him, betrayed him, and abused him. And it all started with his own family. But was that the final chapter? What would his life end in bitterness and resentment? Would he start his own dysfunctional family because that's all he had ever experienced or known? And before we find out a quick synopsis about what happened next, it's really one of the most amazing stories you will ever read about one of the most amazing lives ever lived. Through it all, and I mean through it all, Joseph modeled integrity and faith in God. When he was falsely accused of rape as a slave, he should have been sentenced to death. But because of his integrity, the official sensed that it was false, so to protect Joseph, but to save face, had him sent to prison instead. While in prison, he handled himself with such character, he ends up being in charge of all the other prisoners. One of those prisoners was a high-ranking official of the Pharaoh who was also falsely imprisoned. And when that prisoner was exonerated, he went back to his high office in the Pharaoh's court. When the Pharaoh began to have disturbing dreams that no one could interpret for him, this high official remembered Joseph and Joseph's commitment to his God, and they called Joseph in, and God gave to Joseph the ability to interpret uh, the Pharaoh's dream. A lot of you know the story. Joseph tells the Pharaoh, here is what your dream means. Egypt will experience seven years of abundance and prosperity, and then seven years of famine and scarcity. And Pharaoh, what you should do is store food provisions for the seven years in ab of abundance so that there will be food to eat in the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh, what you should do is find one really smart guy to put in charge of the whole operation. Anybody see where this story is going? Let's read a little more from uh, the biblical story, Genesis 41. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, Joseph, one in whom is the Spirit of God? The Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. When Pharaoh, uh, then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, 
but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. And then everything happened just the way Joseph said. Seven years of abundance, uh, seven years of famine, and people from all over the world during the famine came to Egypt because Egypt had prepared and Egypt had food. And one of the families that came to Egypt to get food was none other than Joseph's own family, his brothers and his dad. And just like his dream, his brothers and his dad surrounded him and bowed down to Joseph. They did not recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. If that's the dream scenario, right? People who have hurt you are now, uh, uh, and now need you, and now you're in a position of power over them, how would you handle that moment? What would you do? What did Joseph do? Joseph forgave them, cared for them, provided for them. How did he do that? After being the victim of such abuse, how did he forgive them and move on? And the Bible has a little clue about this that will be very easy to miss in Joseph's own family now. He has children of his own, and a clue can be found in the name Joseph gave to his firstborn child. Joseph called his firstborn child Manasseh, which in Hebrew means forget. He named his child forget. Now, why would he do that? It sounds like a who's on first routine. Uh, you know, what's the baby's name? Forget. You forgot the baby's name? Uh, no, the babies forget. Yeah, I know babies forget, but you shouldn't forget. Yeah, let's look at what Joseph actually said in the words of the Bible. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, which means forget, and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because he has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God has helped me forget my past, child number one's name, and he's made me see the fruitfulness of my future, child number two's name. God has helped me forget. Now, did Joseph really forget did God really give him some kind of holy amnesia? No, but Joseph chose to look forward. At every stage, Joseph kept looking forward, trying to advance forward. So his forgetting is more about him being able to put it behind him and break the chain of dysfunction and see a new day and look forward. He was charting a new path. The Apostle Paul uh, many centuries later would write something similar. The Apostle Paul said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already uh, arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Forgetting what is behind, straining for what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As Joseph's newborn baby wrapped his finger around Joseph's, uh, wrapped his hands around Joseph's finger, it's if Joseph was saying, I choose to forget what's behind me, and I choose to strain toward that which is ahead. He didn't blame. It's very easy to blame our parents for our lives. The way we were parented, the way that we were not parented, affects us our whole lives long. At the same time, we can and must move past that. Our family of origin explains our behavior, but it doesn't excuse our behavior. We're accountable for our own lives and our own behavior. And the scriptures talk about this as much as it talks about the sins of the parents. Look what it says in Proverbs. Some people curse their father and do not thank their mother. They are pure in their own eyes, but they are filthy and unwashed. They look proudly around, casting disdainful glances, they have teeth like swords and fangs like knives. You kind of get the picture. These people uh, uh, blame their parents. They're not grateful for even the good things that might have happened in their family. 
Craig Harper is an internationally recognized personal development coach, and he wrote an open letter to all adult children. An open letter to all adult children. I'm going to read part of it for you. Uh, his letter starts this way. Dear parent blamer, firstly, let me say, stop it. It's pathetic and pointless. And for the rest of us innocent bystanders, very annoying. To be completely honest, we're sick of your whining, your complaining, your anger, your victim mentality, and your inability to see that your current attitude, not some historical event, is your biggest problem. We're also sick of you blaming your current bad behavior on your parents. What's standing between you and success uh, right now is you. Not your folks, not your history, you. And the fact that you think they have sabotaged your life and are somehow responsible for your current stupid behaviors and less than desirable outcomes reeks of denial, immaturity, and delusion. Yes, we all get that your childhood or parts thereof sucked. Welcome to the world's largest club. Let's be honest and blunt. Some parents are crap. Yeah, that's blunt. I'd call that blunt. And yes, many of us have been hurt physically, emotionally, or psychologically by our parents. I am not suggesting that you deny your past, but I am suggesting that you do not live there. If you want to, to destroy your potential, your enthusiasm, your optimism, and your hope, then become a chronic parent blamer. Or you can let me save you some serious time and pain and just believe me when I tell you that being a parent blamer is a pointless, destructive, pathetic waste of potential and emotional energy. And if you're not careful, a waste of your life. It will destroy you from the inside out. He's got that warm, gentle pastoral tone <laughs> to his writings. And some of us need that kind of stark talking to to get us out of the past and looking to the future. But to his harsh words, I do want to add a pastoral word, if I may. If the dysfunction in the family you grew up in involved physical and sexual abuse or emotional abuse that was severe, I don't think the prescription for you is to just suck it up and move on. According to the Justice Department, more than 80% of sexual abuse offenses against children are committed by people that they know. Parents, relatives, uh, daycare providers, trusted adults, which is why the vast majority of cases are never reported. And when you are violated like that, the sin of the fathers, the sin of the mothers goes beyond parent blaming. And what you need to own is not your own personal responsibility. What you need to own is your need for help. And sometimes a, a third party, a, 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 a trained professional Christian counselor can help you see how the past is affecting you today. They can help you find those places where blaming is keeping you in a prison of your own making and can help you see where you can get past uh, your past and look forward to the future. This is a process. And with each step on the path, we will increasingly be able to say, along with Joseph, what he said as he looked back, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Why? Because now instead of looking back at our family of origin, we're looking forward at future generations. The brothers of Joseph were very afraid that Joseph would retaliate against them, and they should have been afraid. A lesser person would have totally taken it out on them in revenge. I would have been tempted to do so. They were right to be afraid, but Joseph moved with such integrity, and this is the last verse we'll look at today. This is what he says to his terrified brothers when they realize who he is. Don't be afraid, brothers. Am I in the place of God? That's a question all of us have to ask ourselves. Am I in the place of God? Where, where, where does my responsibility stop and God's responsibilities pick up? Am I the judge? Am I the jury? Am I the executioner? Joseph decided, no, I'm not in the place of God. You intended to harm me, brothers. He doesn't let them off the hook. What you did was evil, and your motives were evil. What you did was to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph is now in charge of Egypt. 
He's saving thousands of people, maybe millions of people from starvation. And it was because it would, it would not have happened except that the hardship that he went through. The evil that's been committed against you does not need to hold you back, does not need to cripple you all your days. In fact, God can likely use that to help other people. Next Sunday, we're going to look at a tender exchange between the father of Joseph and the children of Joseph. We're going to take this family study one generation deeper, and we're going to see a grandfather bless his grandchildren. And we're going to get a model for how we can bless not only our kids and our grandkids, but how we can bless our spouse, how we can bless our friends. And we're going to see how Jesus is present in the story of this family. I thought Jesus was only in the New Testament. No, Jesus is right there in the Old Testament, and he's central to this story, and he is the great breaker of the human curse. And we'll get to that next week. Let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we gather today as people who have known both the joy and pain of family. For those who bear wounds and scars of sins committed against them, O oh God, grant healing. Give to us all the courage to seek help, the strength to forgive, the supernatural ability to break free from generational chains, and the vision to see a new way forward. We pray your deep blessing on every person and on every family. Give us homes built on you, our firm foundation. In the life-giving, curse-redeeming name of Jesus Christ, we, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thanks for joining us.